Uh, thanks, Giovanni. So I'm now very excited that, uh, to introduce Thomas Brox as our uh, next keynote spe speaker. Uh, so Thomas uh, received his PhD from uh, Saarland University in Germany and has been a postdoc at the University of Bonn, Dresden and California at Berkeley. And then since 2010, uh, Thomas has been in the University of Freiburg, where he's heading the computer vision group. And uh, we're very excited to have him talk today as part of the workshop. So I'll uh, hand over to Thomas. Um, feel free to share your screen. As a reminder, if anyone has any questions during the talk, please use the Q&A and uh, we can uh, ask them to Thomas afterwards. <clears throat> good, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Very good. Then let's share the screen. Okay. Okay. So you can see it, I guess? Yeah, we can see it fine. Good. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so thank you for inviting me and for the nice introduction. So um, I will talk today a little bit about uh, learning video text embeddings. So that's something that um, we have started in my lab um, yeah, two years ago. And um, yeah, it also fits to this workshop, I think, um, although not everything is uh, in the egocentric view, but of course, um, yeah, many of the videos that you can take are egocentric. Um, so this is uh, work that uh, was mainly done by the PhD students that I present here, of course, and um, that's on one hand, uh, Simon, and on the other hand, Mohamed Reza, and part of the work was also done at, uh, at an internship with Amazon, and um, so Yiju is also um, part of that. So um, yeah, so the idea is that you um, have paired video and text and you want to learn embeddings um, that cover both domains. Yeah, so on one hand, um, you have videos um, like here. And um, on the other hand, you have sentences. Um, the question is a bit, where do they come from? Uh, so they can come from uh, um, speech recognition or they can be uh, text that has been curated. Very often nowadays, people try to actually uh, get it automatically from um, speech recognition. And that means you actually have some kind of an unsupervised learning potentially. At least in the ideal case, you can actually take a video, take the speech recognition, and then um, you actually have the pairing between these two. And the nice thing is that on one hand, you have the videos, which uh, shows uh, visual features. And on the other hand, um, you have uh, text, which describes the semantics. And that's something that you typically don't get for free. So we all um, grew up on the, in the era of uh, glass labels um, where everything had to be annotated. And the nice thing here with uh, video and text is that you potentially can actually get this text for free. Uh, it's, it's not ideal because uh, very often um, some curation has to be done on the text um, nowadays, but um, at least the prospect is there that at one point you can also do it completely unsupervised. And there are also some, some works already that do that. Um, yeah, and that's also the motivation a little bit. Why do you want to use video and text together? So the first motivation is that uh, you use this pairing of, of videos and text as a kind of a supervision for learning your visual features um, together with the semantic rounding that you have. And you can do that just from internet data at scale because you don't need any um, costly annotation. Um, and that's the idea that was, for example, done by, by Mill NCA and, uh, and Clip. And there are a couple of other works that try to just leverage this very large internet data um, to learn visual features that can be then later used um, in the context of video analysis. Yeah, and um, this was also quite successful already. So the features that you learn this way um, are pretty good, although, yeah, um, they are also in competition with feature, unsupervised feature learning in general, where you don't even need the text, but just the video. Um, so there's, um, so both are ways that you can get, you can try to, to follow. The other motivation is that there are just many cross-modal tasks and you don't care about um, paired video and text only for learning good visual features, but you're actually interested in a paired embedding because then you can work on, uh, on, tasks that cover both domains. And one example is that you have text-based um, shot retrieval. So you, you want to find for a, a good video shot um, that you're interested in by describing it with text. Um, and the other example is that you want to do some video captioning um, to maybe summarize a video uh, clip or a video shot. 
And so there are plenty of applications in this domain. And here it's it's not about visual features, but really on the cross modal tasks. And also for those, you of course need to learn an embedding that uh, links the two domains. And for that also you need paired data. Um, and while I, the, the approaches I will talk about will also cover more this, this second motivation um, that you already have maybe some visual features and you already maybe have some, some text features that are already good for themselves. Um, but now you want to learn a joint embedding that uh, links these two domains. We'll see at the very end as, as a motivation, I can also say that some of the approaches that I show here could potentially also be used for motivation one, but we didn't try it yet. And that's why I, I don't want to talk about this <laughs> um, as long as I don't have evidence. So here's just an example um, for text-based video retrieval. Yeah, so you have a query, um, a young person goes snowboarding on the mountain, he goes down, jumps, flips and spins. So that's a description of something you're looking for. And um, then in a large video database, uh, you get here the, the top five result. And you see that they also show some, some snowboarding um, and uh, yeah, also a little bit more detail. So the advantage to class labels where you could also say you just want to search for snowboarding, that would also work. Uh, the advantage is that you actually in the text can describe the things that you're looking for in a bit more detail. So it's not just the glass label snowboarding, but it's also the, the jumps and flips and spins um, that ideally you also want to look for. And, uh, and that's ideally covered by the retrieval here. Um, whoop. Here's an example for uh, video captioning. So here you, um, you see the video and then you want to generate a caption from that. So here the target output would be the text. A young person goes snowboarding on a mountain. He goes down, jumps and flips and spins. Of course, you can also do that formulated as a retrieval task. If you have lots of pairs between video and text, you can also just find the text part in a retrieval fashion. But um, uh, video captioning is a bit wider where um, you can also uh, make descriptions that are not in the database, but you can actually leverage a bit more. At least that's the idea. Um, we never know in how much deep learning is able to go beyond um, just uh, seeing what it has seen before. Um, but uh, in, in principle, these generators have become pretty good. Uh, also, you can also use a very a fancy language mo model these days, and then the caption generator can do more than just um, produce text that you have in the database. OK, so what are the challenges here? Um, so on one hand, it's the challenge of integrating temporal details on one hand, and then long-term content on the other hand. So if you have a, a long video, then there's a lot of context. And on the other hand, you also want to localize maybe a specific part that you're looking for. And that's something that in computer vision, we are um, we know that very well uh, in the spatial domain. So also there, we want to uh, maybe localize a certain object. And at the same time, we want to use the context of the whole image. Um, and we know that we can do that uh, very well by using some hierarchies. Also, actually, all these convolutional networks were built on hierarchies. Um, before that, even there were hierarchical approaches. And although transformers now don't use the hierarchy directly explicitly, but in the end, what they learn is partially also a hierarchy. So the idea to cover that is um, to use hierarchies. And I will also show a work um, where we uh, implemented this. Um, the other challenge is that you want to learn robust embeddings, so uh, some uh, embeddings that um, allow you uh, to, to uh, deal also with noise that you have in the pairing, because that happens very often, especially when you learn from uncurated data. And um, here um, we have a, a work that um, leverages on the uh, contrastive learning and makes that learning loss a um, bit more robust. OK, I will now go into these two works. And um, the first one is, is called COOT. It uh, stands for Cooperative Hierarchical Transformer. And it, um, yeah, it shows the idea that you, that you want to use a hierarchy to cover um, so the, the temporal details to localize well, but on the other hand, also use more context in the video. Now, so if you just have this video and you um, treat it as, as one piece, and then you have, on the other hand, um, the text paragraph and you also treat it as one piece, then yeah, they both map with their features into an embedding space at one point. And now you have to bring these two, two points together. Yeah, so that would be the, uh, the flat approach. And the idea here is that um, you 
want to have both a local embedding space where you actually split the video into different clips. And on the other hand, you have your paragraph and you split it up into different sentences. And then actually for each sentence and clip, you can map to this embedding space, to this local embedding space. And on the other hand, you have an embedding space that is global and computes um, yeah, the, the features for a whole paragraph and a whole video. Uh, and um, then you can actually try to link these two spaces. And that means you can actually use the, the context of the global embedding space to help the localization of the local embedding space. This idea is not completely new, so it uh, exists already in two, since 2018 um, in, in this context of cross-modal learning. That time it was still done with LSTMs. Um, so the principle was already there. We did that um, with a bit more modern techniques like transformers and so on. Okay, so how does that work now? So you have on one hand the video branch that um, yeah show, gives you these different clips here. So let's say we have n different clips, and they are then um, uh, processed by some fully connected layer. So you assume that you already have the a, a video representation that is pre-trained maybe on some action classification data set or some other unsupervised uh, learning approach, and then um, you fit, fit that into a transformer that turns that into this local embedding, so this local representation. And you do that independently for every clip. And then these results here, these embeddings go then in another transformer that combines this, um, this local information into a global embedding. And that's what you then have here. And you have the same thing for the text branch. So also here you have, you assume you have some um, text embeddings for sentences. Um, they go into a transformer. Um, and then you get an embedding, a local representation, and these um, local uh, representations then again go into a transformer um, that can gives you a global representation. Okay, so here is the local part, here is the global part. Um, the, for the global part, we also use the whole video as a, as a whole and put that into a transformer that just gives us another input here and the same for the text. Um, and then, of course, very important, you also need to link these two representations because so far they are just independent for videos and for text. And that's the cross-modal thing, you want to connect them. And for that, you do some alignment with um, a contrastive loss. So um, you align both the, um, the local representation and the global representation. There was one detail here that's this um, AFA pool um, layer here that's just an attention aware feature aggregation. Of course, you, you need to aggregate the information from the different frames. And um, for that, we just um, yeah, introduced a new pooling that um, highlights those components that have more local relationships. Yeah, so you have here actually this input sequence with the different frames and um, you then have here some attention matrix and that builds then the aggregation uh, sum. So that's a weighted sum. Yeah, so it's a small detail. Okay, so the advantage of uh, this um, local global uh, linkage is that you can uh, now um, link also the local entities via the global context. Yeah, so for example, here you have a woman um, speaking about um, how to mix ingredients to make chocolate cookies. And um, there are here these different parts here. And you have this typical problem that um, yeah, you have the word woman. And um, of course, in the next um, clip, it could be another woman, but uh, it's actually the same woman. And also the cookies um, are connected here. So you can actually connect all these reappearing things here via the global context. Yeah, and uh, that's a big advantage of um, having this local global um, uh, approach. And um, here's a bit more detail about how this works. So this is this um, interlevel cooperation between the global context and the local one. So you have here as input your local context, here your global context, they both go into a transformer. And then um, the transformer for the global context also gets the, um, the local context uh, uh, or the result from the, from the local transformer as input. Now, so that's what I showed already in the in the bigger graph um, that yeah you have here the whole video for example yeah and then you have the output of your um, local transformer yeah, and in the end you connect the two and then you get your final output. Another um, small detail that we did in in CUT is that we um, added apart from this um, uh, a 
the contrastive loss, um, we also uh, added a cross-modal cycle consistency. So that's a new idea where you, so you all know cycle consistency. So you go back and forth, and uh, if if you end up at the same point where you started, then this is consistent, so it's good. And if you end up somewhere else, then you actually have a penalty. And you can do that also for uh, cross-modal learning. So here we have on one hand the video, and we have the text, and we can now actually go from the text and retrieve uh, the nearest um, uh, image from, from the video. Um, and then we can actually map from there to the nearest um, uh, text sample uh, on the text side. And then if you end up at the same point, then there is no loss. And otherwise, there is a loss that uh, depends on how far away they are. And uh, we actually use here an index loss. So it really measures on how far away they are in, in the temporal space. And um, so that means if you actually map up to the same um, entity back and forth, then that's good. And if you um, actually end up somewhere else, then that's bad. So that means um, it, it learns embeddings that are consistent when you jump back and forth between video and text. OK, um, so here now some retrieval results. Um, so the query here would be a young person go snowboarding on a mountain. You know that one already. That was my initial example. And then these are the, the top five examples. Um, that you would get. And um, here are some, some numbers on that. Yeah, so we tested that on ActivityNet on one hand and on UCOOK2 on the other hand. And um, yeah, then you see that the retrieval rates, in, especially the uh, retrieval at one, uh, so the, basically the top one retrieval uh, performance um, is quite interesting. And um, you see it's, it's pretty high here for that. And you can do that both from a paragraph to a video. Um, so that's at the global level, um, but also, um, yeah, um, paragraph to video um, for you go and sentence to clip. Yeah, so here you would have the, the more local representation on ActivityNet, you cannot do that. But on UCOOK2, you can actually test these two different levels. Um, and you see it's much harder to actually find uh, the right clip uh, from the sentence than uh, than the video from a paragraph, just because the chance level is much higher. Yeah, so um, you have far more sentences and clips than you have paragraphs and videos. And here you also can imagine that if you use the global context to um, first localize um, approximately, then uh, the task gets easier. But here's some ablation study, um, which of the components um, are uh, contributing what and um, yeah, first of all, there's a comparison to this um, HSE work from ECCB 2018, which already had a hierarchy, but with LSTM. So you see um, basically the improvement that you just get by using a transformer model. Um, so that's basically um, what you would have here. Yeah, so this first line and the second line. So you see you get improvement just by using uh, a transformer. And you can then um, try different aggregation functions. So um, there was this um, attention aware feature aggregation, and you see that um, gives you the, the best performance here, um, but already max pooling is also performing quite well. So the improvement is only a little bit. Um, and um, then here's the ablation for all these other things. So here the between max pooling and AFA, and then also this um, cross modal uh, cycle consistency loss. Um, so that's um, activated here. Um, you see it, it gives you a little bit of an improvement. Let's say what, uh, yes, the comparison. Yeah, so this one and this one, you see it, it doesn't improve, each individual uh, measure doesn't improve a lot, um, but if you aggregate them together, then, then they help and you get quite a bigger jump. So that's how it is nowadays very often that, <laughs> um, there is not this big, uh, big bang when you implement something, but uh, you actually have to aggregate and have to do a few things right um, to get a larger improvement. Okay, and then here's the cooperative transformer. So that's this um, uh, cooperation between local and global context, and also that helps a little bit. Yeah, but you see that in total, the jump here is, is quite large. Good, here are some qualitative results. Um, so for te text retrieval here, um, so here we show a video clip and then 
you get the, the top ranked text and here you see it, it um, picks the right one. So a woman is resting next to crashing water. She's smoking a pipe. She blows out a plume of smoke and that has the highest score. And the next one is actually not that good anymore. No? So a close up of a man's chin is shown. Yeah, so that's um, pretty wrong. And so here it works well, but that might be also because there were actually no fierce competitors among the <laughs> samples. Here's another query um, video, so with some dancing. And yeah, here it doesn't pick the, the best example, um, which would be a woman stands in front of a crowd of people on a public sidewalk and dances with a male dance partner in ballroom style dance. And yeah, you see actually that um, all the top results have something to do with dance. So this, this dancing um, has been picked up in the visual features, um, but the details about what's going on in the background or what exact type of dance it is, um, that has not been picked up. And that's why the, the top result uh, or the, the, the top result that is spit out by the method is actually only rank 16. Um, so it's not, and you also see the score is actually not ideal. Yeah, so you see all these works, although they produce good numbers, um, relatively good numbers on benchmarks, um, there's still a lot of do to um, make them perfect. And uh, there's um, a lot of failure as well. Um, here's um, an example for yeah, video retrieval on, on this other data set on UCOOK2. And um, yeah, here it's the query melt butter in the pan. And yeah, of course there are multiple examples where you melt the butter in a pan and um, yeah, they, the top results all show butter being melt in a pan and um, that's quite good. So also the scores are relatively comparable. Um, here's a failure case, slice the bamboo shoots into strips and then well, again, so the slicing has been somehow picked up as a word that you use some, some knife or something to get something into strips. But um, the question is what you slice there or what you chop. And actually it finds a, that um, chopping a bundle of parsley is the right one for here, although it has nothing to do with bamboo shoots. Um, and the right answer is actually here on rank 168, so quite far away. Yeah, so you see the the details um, are not really captured well by the features yet. Okay, um, here um, is some, some more results on video captioning. We also implemented a, a captioning model up on top of that. We based that on, on MART. Um, that's a transformer-based captioning module. And um, then we just replaced the appearance and flow features that MART has with uh, these CUT embedding that, um, we, uh, that we learned. And um, yeah, that we trained that actually with 100 times less video data than the original MART model. And you see it gives good results here also on, on video captioning. Also, yeah, that, that shows just that the um, embedding is relatively good, this cross-modal linkage. Um, but um, what we didn't do is actually change the visual features or the language features bef before that. Now from that, we don't have any influence. Here again, a, a qualitative example for uh, video captioning. Yeah, so that the ground truth would be chop celery, apple, red grapes, and roasted walnuts, walnuts um, whisk mayonnaise, lemon juice, and pepper, and combine with the fruits and nuts, place the salad on lettuce. Yeah, so that's what the video shows. And here's what Mart and um, Kut produce. Yeah, actually, Mart is pretty wrong. Yeah, they think you chop red onion and garlic and add the beef to a bowl. So I guess uh, all the objects actually don't fit. Um, yeah, that's probably just because the visual features are uh, not good for this video. Um, and could it's a little bit better. So the celery root has been detected and um, also the lemon juice, um, but it hallucinates some olive oil and salt and pepper. Pepper is good, but not the salt. Um, and yeah, the, the rest is again, okay. Yeah, so again, what we have seen before, so the details are not always right, which is probably due to the visual feature um, interpretation uh, is, not, is not perfect. Okay, so we haven't talked about um, how this um, 
contrastive learning uh, works. So actually in CUT, we just used a, a normal uh, max margin loss. Um, but in this other work, this cross CLR work, we actually try to leverage here a bit um, the, the visual features in a better way um, to improve this cross-modal contrastive loss. Uh, and uh, this contrastive loss is quite common to learn cross-modal embeddings um, um, because you can easily um, take the features from a text encoder and of an image encoder and then just um, have a contrastive loss to maximize um, the pairs uh, so that are paired up, that they give you a, a small distance and uh, those that don't pair up should get a, um, a large distance. Yeah, and this is the cross-modal contrastive learning here with, with CLIP in this example. Um, and yeah, the whole thing ensures the similarity of video and text of the same sample. Yeah, so that's that's ensured. Um, but the question is a bit what about the within modality similarity between the samples? Yeah, so for example, here you have a dog, but there might be other dog images, and they might actually also link to the text that contains dogs. And the, the problem is that in this uh, normal um, contrastive learning, they count as negative samples, and that means they are actually pushed away, and um, that's actually not what you want. Yeah, and that's why where the cross CLR loss that um, we create um, leverages uh, this this problem. So um, we keep the similarity of samples consistent with the original embedding space. So here you, you see this illustration. So you have here the video embedding space with a couple of samples here. You have the text embedding space. And now you have some, some pairing. So for example, this rectangle and this um, video embedding part, they should be now close together. That's this intermodality uh, positive sample. And you put that into your contrastive loss. And then you have some other samples like the one here um, between this one and this one. These are not paired and that means they should be pushed away. Um, and what we now add is that um, we also have an intramodality loss, which uh, says that if these two are close by together, then they should also be close by. Or actually, in this case, if they are far apart, like here, then they should also be far apart in the joint embedding space. Yeah, so you try to keep um, the uh, embedding space consistent also with the original embeddings in the video and text space. Yeah, so on one hand, you want to pair text and video and they should be arranged in the, in the right way so that such a text and video fits together. Um, but doing that, you don't want to lose the actual embedding of the video or the embedding of the text, yeah, so the shape of that. And um, that's what we do by adding this intramodality loss here. So this, um, this orange one, yeah, so here. Okay, and you can easily do that um, in this uh, normal contrastive loss. Yeah, so you have here your positive pair, yeah, so the video and the text. Um, and then um, here are the negative pairs between modalities. You see that these are the, um, the negative samples that are not being paired. And now we put here some intramodality negative pairs. So these are just from the video, so within the video space. And if they are far apart in the original space, then they stay far apart um, also in this uh, joint embedding space. Yeah, and that's the whole thing for the video part. And here we do the same for the text video loss. Yeah, so here the thing is between uh, text and video. And then you have here the text part and here also the things on text. Yeah, so that it's um, symmetric to the video text loss. Yeah, and um, that already um, helps to keep the um, joint embedding consistent with the original embeddings. Another problem that we tried to solve here um, was um, about false negative pairs and um, uh, influential samples. Yeah, so um, an example of a false negative pair is, uh, for example, you have some text which says cut tomato and put it in a bowl. And um, then you have another example like cut tomatoes and mix with the herbs. Uh, and they are two different samples. And because they are two different samples, they are said that they, they have nothing to do with each other. Uh, so they are put as negative pairs. Of course, not all of them, but it might be that uh, among the pairs that you sample, you just sample these two here. Yeah, and that's actually bad because you would like to connect actually the semantic meaning of tomato with the other 
a tomato and uh, the cutting of tomato it even fits together yeah so these are actually things that are pretty similar and um, yeah if we say that these should actually not have nothing to do with each other then this hampers the linkage of semantic content the question is how can you now reduce this effect and um, the idea that we have here is that we um, um, remove so-called influential samples from the negative set and um, we just say that um, samples that have many connections uh, to other samples so that in the original uh, embedding space of video or text um, are strongly connected with other samples that they actually have some semantic meaning that links very often to to other um, similar content and um, we measure that just by sample connectivity and then we exclude those from the negative pairs yeah so if we have one of these influential samples we um, don't put them as negative pair into the contrastive loss okay and we can now compare this um, cross CLR loss um, to the normal contrastive losses there are a couple of uh, flavors of that um, and you see that here for uh, the UCOOK2 data set and also this uh, LSMDC data set, which is on, um, on videos um, uh, from, from movies. And uh, yeah, you see that um, you consistently get um, quite some improvement over the other losses here uh, when you use this cross CLR loss. That's just because you, you keep it um, consistent with the original embedding and you take into account uh, these uh, influential samples. And here are some retrieval results um, on, on UCOOK2 and again on LSMDC for the full model. Um, so the previous one was just an ablation study to compare directly the loss. Um, and also here you see when you compare that to a couple of uh, methods that were state of the art at that time, then you see, um, yeah, it gives you quite some, some boost, um, both from text to video um, on UCOOK2 and also on uh, LSMDC. Um, so it's compatible with the state of the art models. And actually, since we used CUT as the um, as the base model, um, yeah, here you actually see that's just the improvement here that's coming from um, this cross CLR loss. Uh, so that uh, has quite some influence. So as a summary, um, I uh, showed some hierarchical transformer so that. Um, uh, links the clip and video level embeddings. So it, it uses a, a temporal hierarchy as we are used to um, build up spatial hierarchies um, to analyze our images. And the same works also in the, in the video uh, text domain. Um, and then I showed the, the cross CLR loss, um, which keeps the joint embedding consistent with the original embeddings and also avoids false negative pairs via influential samples. Although that was this example with, uh, with cutting tomatoes. Um, what's next? So I, I mentioned at the beginning that um, you very often also want to use video and text pairings um, to do self-supervised learning. And there have been already a couple of works doing that. Um, it's quite some computational effort because you want to leverage very large data sets and you need a lot of compute. So that's also why we have not done it yet. <laughs> um, but in principle, that's a very good direction. And in this cross CLR loss that I showed, although we assumed that we are given some um, embeddings that are pre-trained, um, you can of course still refine these embeddings by um, running this cross CLR loss. Yeah, so you would. Um, have a consistent embedding in the original space, also consistent in the joint embedding, and then you could refine actually all these three embeddings um, in one round. We, we haven't done that yet, but that, that might be a direction um, that's worth exploring if you, one has to compute for doing so. Uh, and the other idea um, or the other challenge that still has to be done, we have seen that from the, from the results also, that the higher level understanding um, is still missing in, in all these approaches yeah so the retrieval typically works pretty well because um, yeah the features know about some keywords that they probably picked up from some original classification pre-training tasks uh, and that's why they can distinguish this but if it goes about details that were not maybe in this pre-training features well represented then the whole thing doesn't work that well anymore um, and also the long-term context of a video is typically not understood by these approaches and there is a lot to do. 
it's not so easy to find out yeah how, how to do that yeah so yeah, i think this whole video text um embedding learning is uh, is a quite promising field uh and yeah i i guess also others see that thank you very much and um yeah um i'm open to answer also some questions Okay, thanks, Thomas, for the very uh, interesting talk there. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I have a couple myself. So um, for the first work where you're um, talking about the local and global alignment, um, I might have missed it, but did you try, um, do you just do like pairwise alignment between, say, like the um, local portions of the video and the caption or, or the paragraph? Or did you try like increasing the context uh, further? So just wondering, you know, sometimes paragraphs and videos, there's not this direct one-to-one -one mapping between um, how things are described. Yeah, so um, let me go back to that. So yeah, maybe it's better to see here. Mm -hmm. So you, you have on one hand, you have these local representations that you get in here and you do that for each stream independently. Yeah. Um, and then you have here the global, so the whole video also goes into a transformer and that's also fed. So you have both, so in this part here, you have both the local embeddings and also the raw data that, that goes into this. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that answers your question. Um, or, yeah, or so, so you have a, a loss, right, which um, brings together the global representations, but you also have a loss which brings together the local representations, right? Or did I miss? Yeah, so that's this contrastive loss. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So here you have uh, between the local representations, you have a contrastive loss that makes sure that the local representations match between the pairs. So between the clip and, and the sentence. And then you have another contrastive loss that um, um, uh, makes sure that the embedding at the yeah, video and paragraph level also fits. So you have right. both of them. Yeah. yeah, so I think my question was, so for example, in like clip one, is that only um, the loss only applies to like clip one and sentence one? Or have you tried that with say like clip one and sentence two, because they might be like close enough? Ah, that's what you mean. Actually, because yeah, yeah. If, if the alignment is not perfect, yeah. that's what you mean, right? Um, we haven't done that. So actually in this middle NCE, that's the idea that you actually mm -hmm. use a couple of neighbors and you also say they they one of them might be the correct one. Um, here we actually assume that um, it's the correct one, but you're right. The point is we, we worked here mainly with curated data where the alignment is pretty good. Um, then that doesn't make sense to look at the broader video, but you're completely right. If you learn from how to 100 million, for example, then it's very important that you allow for some um, alignment mistake. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And um, I have another question regarding the, uh, like the false false negatives and um, how you constructed the loss, which added the within modal um, or the intermodal um, aspects. And I was thinking that, so that requires like good visual features or video, good video and good uh, caption features to start with. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering how, so on, for example, on stuff like Epic, I've done video text retrieval and I found that the starting features, even from like quite a well um, trained model, um, even if the, the actions could be quite different, uh, semantically but because they're like close temporally they have like quite a close video representation um, and did you find that in when you're doing that work or have you found that with a kind of a core coarse grain data sets you don't run into that issue as much yeah well you're right so th that's definitely an issue and um i think also in the qualitative results we we have seen a few mistakes which i actually attribute to the pre-trained features that you have for video and, and text and we we don't actually modify them anymore we just uh, try to fix things in the in the joint embedding um yeah and i think clearly um yeah that's also what i mentioned as a next step you you actually should also change these um these initial embeddings yeah but it, yeah that's of course a bit more costly yeah um and uh yeah it's <laughs> it's not a quick test but uh yeah that's definitely the right direction um to iteratively um, go over the, or, um, yeah, let's say single modal embeddings and the joint embeddings and, and learn them jointly. Okay, thanks. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Are those on the panel? Feel free to unmute if you have any. Uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, I have a question about your work in video captioning. So uh, thanks for your good talk. 
So uh, my question is, although uh, you show that our model uh, don't well aligned with the ground juice, like some uh, ingredients like olive oil, salt, but actually uh, in the video side, uh, it is uh, unseen. So, and also it's very common uh, in the world that uh, uh, some, some, uh, some actually some contexts are not described uh, in the visual side. So uh, we, we cannot really say, although it's not aligned with the ground truth, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not perfect. So in your opinion, uh, in this kind of case, I, I would say it is kind of dead base, right? So uh, what's your opinion about this? Yeah, you're totally right. So it's, as soon as you talk about captioning, then measuring performance in terms of numbers is, is much harder <laughs> because uh, yeah, comparing texts is difficult. So all the NLP people know that <laughs> um, there have been all these different metrics. And um, yeah, the other problem that you mentioned is that uh, yeah, the, the text might not describe everything that you see in the video. And if you then just say, I, I have seen that, then it counts as a mistake, which is actually wrong, right? So there actually, it's, the problem is that there is not one ground truth answer, but actually many ground truth answers. And um, that's just a problem of benchmarking, I would say. But of course, qualitatively, you can also check whether um, examples work. Of course, then you cannot compare easily because you don't have numbers. Um, but yeah, anyway, I. I'm always a friend and I also tell my students that they should always look at the results and not just look at numbers. Um, in, in, when I grew up as a PhD student, you were actually only looking at 10 examples. And um, if you were happy with the 10 examples, then you wrote a paper. And then we get went to all this benchmarking where you could actually do that all more large scale and so on. I think nowadays we have to go a bit back to um, maybe also looking at the examples again. And then of course you see whether the things make sense or not. And you can have your internal statistics if you look at enough samples, <laughs> um, if the things are doing what they should or not. I'm not sure, but I think in this, I know, uh, where was it? Um, this example with the olive oil, I think there was no olive oil, was there? But that's just, just a detail. Um, <laughs> I think I think there was none, so it was hallucinating the olive oil. But of course, you're right; it, there could be also some olive oil and uh, not be in the caption. Uh, yeah, thank you for your answer. I really appreciate your idea that not just to focus on numbers, but look at the real problem. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, any other questions? Uh, I can't see any. Okay, well, thanks again to Thomas for the very uh, interesting presentation. Um...